young voices, big issues. Join us as we explore the real power of Youth Rising. Youth Rising. Youth Rising. The Youth Rising podcast by NCS. Hi, this is Youth Rising by NCS, where young people raise their voice to make a positive difference together. We're the podcast for young people, made by young people. I'm Musin, and on this episode, we're talking about the environment. The Youth Rising podcast by NCS. It feels as though our generation is much more aware of the climate crisis. We have watched CO2 levels reach record highs, seen countries suffer from wildfires and floods, the list of threatened species rise, and plastic pollution poisoning our wildlife. There are many incredible people raising their voices to encourage us to do our bit to save the planet. But how much does our bit matter? The ocean. The largest habitat on Earth. I care about climate justice and a living planet. You know, just closing your eyes and just listen to nature. Just listen to the voices of this ocean, the voices of this nature. If we stopped all human activities, then in 18 hours there would be no more sound in the ocean. This is everybody's issue, and so it's up to all of us to help fix it. Anyone, no matter how old or young, can go out and change the world if they really do care and they really do want to. What we do in the next few years will determine the next few thousand years. You just heard the Annie Moyes documentary, A Voice Above Nature, BBC's Blue Planet 2, Netflix's A Life on Our Planet, plus Alice Aidy, Kids Against Plastic and Bird Girl, who we'll be hearing from late in the show. The Youth Rising Podcast by NCS. It's hard not to feel frustrated and fearful, but we want to turn that frustration into a conversation. So in this episode, we're asking, whose job is it to save the planet? Lottie spoke to Ella and Amy Meek, sisters and founders of Kids Against Plastic, about how we can all do our bit to save the planet. Thank you so much for coming today. It's an absolute pleasure. I'd love you to start by telling me just what is Kids Against Plastic? Well, Kids Against Plastic is our charity that we founded back in 2016. Initially, it was just as a small project that we ran with our family to try and do our small bit for the environment because we just found out at that point about the terrible impacts of plastic pollution. But from there, it's grown to us helping other people find ways that they can tackle the issues and trying to inspire as many young people as we can as well as part of the charity. So what is plastic pollution and why is it so harmful? Well, plastic pollution is a very broad issue, so (laughs) it's a bit difficult to answer that one. But it's something that's got a devastating impact on the environment because of how many different ways you can find plastic litter everywhere. So an obvious form is obviously litter you see on your local lay-by or down the roads. But then there's also plastic that gets broken down into tiny microplastics, which can then be eaten by fish and say, going up the food chain, we can end up eating it as well. And a shocking one for us was actually microfibers that come from our clothing, get washed down the drains and into the ocean after every wash of our clothes. So yeah, plastic pollution is a very broad and big issue there's so many different areas to tackle and it can seem really overwhelming but that's why we think it's really important to break it down into smaller and more achievable issues such as items of single-use plastic and how you can avoid them by just using reusables and simple ways you can stop microfibers from washing down the drains by using the bags to filter out the plastic and just using things like cotton and bamboo clothing instead so it might seem like a huge issue but there are some (laughs) achievable ways to tackle it as well as this we want to talk about obviously you're collecting 100,000 pieces of plastic which is so cool what kind of sparked that idea initially we found out this fact that allegedly 100,000 sea mammals are killed by plastic in the oceans every year and especially at our ages that we were at the time because we were 12 and 10 and massive animal lovers and so to hear that fact to us was just horrifying Mm -hmm. and really scary and so we thought you know, that would be a perfect target to try and reach with litter picking. So it was definitely an ambitious goal, but I think for us, we saw it as much as a way to clean up the environment. It was a really great awareness project because 
it is quite a shocking number and when people ask about it it's a great way to start talking about the issues and segueing into some of the problems that plastic is causing so it did take us Oh God, almost six years, I think, to reach it. We reached it at Christmas Eve wow. in 2021. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Obviously, you're two young people who've tackled climate change. Why do you think it's important for others to kind of do the same thing? Well, we've always tried to emphasise through the charity how important youth voices are listened to. And so it's been really great over the years as issues like plastic pollution and climate change are more on the agenda and more in the news to see lots of young people stepping up and taking action. And it's something that we think is really important because the youth are the ones that are going to inherit this planet in the future. And so if we're passionate about something, the adults not taking action shouldn't be something that holds us back. It should be something that makes us more passionate to try and do something as quickly as possible before it's too late. Yeah, and something that's always been really important to us when looking at issues like plastic and climate change is that on surface level, they can look like two completely unrelated problems. And it's kind of like we've either got to choose to tackle plastic or we've got to choose to tackle climate change when actually that's not the case at all. And so many environmental issues, social issues are all so interconnected. And so we we shouldn't view them as these untouchable things that are so overwhelming and so impossible to fix. We should actually see them as an opportunity to all get involved and tackle loads of different areas and really work together and trying to solve these problems before it's too late. Last time Amy and I spoke, I was like the worst at single-use plastic bottles, but that I've now almost completely cut out. (laughs) Thank you very much. (laughs) What advice would you give to people trying to sort that out? I think exactly as you said, starting small and taking it one Mm. item at a time because... You know, we run a charity against plastic and we're not completely plastic free because for the everyday person, it's pretty unachievable. You know, it's really expensive. Mm. We've got very, very little choice in most supermarkets and shops. And so if we look at all of the plastic we're consuming in our lives and think, right, we're going to cut all of this out in one go, it kind of just leaves you in a situation where you're thinking, this is impossible. How on earth can I do this? I'm going to do nothing at all. And ultimately what we need is everyone to do something rather than one person to do everything and so we always encourage especially when it comes to plastic is just looking at for example the top four items that you use in your school or that you use at home or used in a local cafe or business and look at trying to cut them down as a first step because then you've got the perfect launch pad to start talking about the issues more or taking your action a step further and looking at the other ways that you can reduce the impact you have. You're right, it's really overwhelming when you first start doing it and you're like, oh, there's so much. (laughs) How do I cut things out? (laughs) So I've got here as well that you encourage people to join things like litter picking groups and going out and picking litter and you both do it yourself as well. Where do you start with that? Where do you find a litter picking group or did you just kind of go out on your own and give it a go? I think it depends on how you want to go about it really I think litter picking is such an amazing way to get started in tackling plastic pollution because Mm. whilst cleaning up all of the litter in the environment is not going to be possible until we start to reduce plastic it's such a great way to feel like you're making a, a real difference especially in your local community when you see that your local park is so much cleaner than when you arrived half an hour ago from your actions so I think it's totally possible as an individual or with your family or sibling as it is for us but if you want to find a local group there are so many popping up around the world really to get involved with and really build that community that you can then use to do other actions in the community as well like um, encourage like schools and cafes and businesses to become what we call plastic clever and start to actually tackle this litter at the source as well and having more people behind you in that is such a great way to go about it yeah and if there aren't any litter picking groups around you you can always start one yourself exactly there's always going to be someone Mm. that's interested but just don't have the courage to be the first person to start it so yeah don't be afraid to do that (laughs) the title of this episode is called whose job is it to save the planet whose job do you think it is to save the planet i think that we'd say it's everyone's job because If we just wait for someone else to do the work, there's really no guarantee that we're ever going to see that happen. And with the amount of time that we've known about climate change and how little has been done to tackle it over all those years, it's really an issue that none of us can afford to sit back on now and just 
wait for someone else to clean up the mess and we all have such an important voice and an important role to play in this issue and so I think we'd say it's really down to all of us to do our bit and and push for the change that we want to see. Well thank you very much for coming to chat to me today I've really really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having having us. (laughs) Our Youth Rising team also got together to talk about some of the ways we can reduce our carbon footprint. What we did at the Did you know that the amount of emails you're subscribed to adds to your carbon footprint? Well, it's such a pain anyway, being subscribed to so many emails just to go through and delete them because I don't use read them anyway. So I guess just that little thing of having to unsubscribe, which will take all of two seconds can actually lower my carbon footprint there's so many as well that like i've subscribed to a couple years ago and i no longer care about that thing of a subject and yet we've still got it going yeah i can second that i've got the same kind of headache when it comes to opening up my emails and i've seen thousands of emails and some of them are the most irrelevant definitely have far too many of those (laughs) that we just delete on site and it's like why we're still subscribed because we can't be bothered to unsubscribe it's also subscribing to things that you think, oh, they're offering me a 10% discount. I'm just going to subscribe, even though I'm probably not going to buy anything from them. But I want my 10% discount anyway. So I'm just going to subscribe for the fun of it. So maybe... Just okay. in case. Yeah, just in case I am going to buy from them. But I think maybe not doing that as often and maybe thinking, actually, let me look at the website first. Let me see if I'm going to buy anything. And then I'll click out and re-click into the website to then get my 10% discount code. Also, that's kind of like, um, you know, when you go to a store and there's a discount and or a sale and you're like, oh my God, it, there's a sale. I don't need these clothes. But um, I easily forget like how bad my like fast fashion habits can be, especially because like when I live in Brighton, I, I've discovered like there's a lot of secondhand stores and they're so good. They've got like such great quality clothing, but um, it's just really easy for me to fall into the trap of buying cheap, quick things because they're just so accessible. Yeah, you see a sale and you're like, oh my God, that's so good. What if I someday want that? I'll grab it while it's on sale. Yeah, especially with online shopping as well. And the thing is, you never actually end up returning it. And also, even if you do returning it, think about the carbon footprint, you know, that package has to go all the way back to where it came from. And and if it's from somewhere like Sheen, it's going all the way back to China or where it comes from. If you think about that as well, all the packaging used... All of these things you order to try on, um, say next was free delivery, that type of thing. So you order them and you get all these empty packages and these plastic wraps and then they go in the bin and then you send it back and then you order something else. It's a huge loop in which you're just wasting loads of plastic. So much plastic waste. Exactly. And when you're repackaging as well, you well, oftentimes I'd find that I'd have to pack, break, get my own kind of like, I don't know, packaging to wrap it back up and I'm buying more stuff that's plastic and that's durable and that'll last that journey back. Yeah, it's true because, let's be honest, we don't really take that much care when unwrapping things. So a lot of the times it's not reusable because we're just ripping it. <laughs> I was also lucky enough to sit down with the amazing Dr. My Rose Craig, a.k.a. Bird Girl. Maya Rose is a British Bangladeshi ornithologist, campaigner for equal rights and the youngest British person to be awarded an honorary doctorate in science. I spoke to her about the importance of birds to our ecosystem, how racism intersects with conservation work and why we need to get back to nature. I just want to kind of tap into some of the things that you've been doing. How do you describe yourself now in terms of the work that you do? I am an environmental campaigner and activist. Mm. There are so many more nuances to that, but I think like that doesn't really capture, especially in terms of like my pet project. Something that's been incredibly close to my heart is my charity Black to Nature, which is all about anti-racism and pushing for diversity. And I'm not sure if lots of environmentalists would even consider that an environmentalist project even though I personally do. Tell me a little bit more about Black to Nature like how do you think conservation intersects with racism for example? My whole route into activism, campaigning, um, all this sort of thing was through bird watching of all things like I come from a family that's very very into birds which means that since before I can remember I've always had like a really strong connection with nature and the outdoors but I'm also 
not white. My mum's side of the family is Bangladeshi. When I was 13, I ended up setting up Black to Nature, which is my charity that runs nature camps that's all about working with kids who live in inner city areas, but especially kids from black and Asian minority ethnic backgrounds, and just taking them out and giving them that opportunity to engage with nature, which I think is really important from two different perspectives. Like in terms of the people that I'm working with, I think it's so important in terms of these conversations about mental health and physical health and people looking after themselves and being in green spaces is just so good for us. And I think in modern society, it absolutely has become like a middle or upper class privilege to have access to those spaces, which I think is like outrageous. And then on the flip side of things, also we're going through various environmental crises at the moment you constantly have people moaning about like oh why don't people seem to care about these things and I honestly think that lots of people have no reason to if they've never gone out and experienced nature in the outdoors why should they care about deforestation if they've never stepped foot in a forest um so I also think like simultaneously we're trying to push for people to engage with those issues on a much deeper level and then therefore hopefully want to do something about them. But also so many people I talk to are really scared of going out into the countryside for the first time because they perceive it as a really white space where they're not welcome. And, you know, I talk to people who are genuinely scared of being hate crimed if they venture out of the city. So I think, again, there is this wider cultural issue of feeling like, you know, this is our space, these are the issues we talk about, these are the places we live. And over there, those are, like, concerns or issues for white people. And I think blurring that line is going to be incredibly important because so many people, when I talk to them and, you know, actually have conversations about how environmental issues impact people now and it is an issue now and we should all be very worried, I think that really is a light bulb moment because they've just never really thought about it like that before. I'm a British Bangladeshi myself. I think there's a lot of historical context to that. If you think about our ancestors, they came here to Brick Lane first before Mm. they moved out to the capital and we still find our ancestors and our family and our communities in cities rather than in kind of Mm. rural areas. But if you think about the Asian community, Bangladesh itself is probably one of the most rural places yeah, in the world absolutely. and it's, it's full of forests and wildlife and it's, it's so beautiful. I think as a generation, especially, we haven't had the opportunity to grow up in an environment that is of nature and that's mm. why we're so fearful mm. of going into wildlife. In terms of Black to Nature, you've been obviously highlighting some of that, haven't you? Do you want to tell me a little bit more about the role that you've been playing in changing terms and adopting new ways of addressing minority communities instead of BME and why does that matter so much? For a lot of people it is the visual aspect of being clearly different and feeling like you're able to be visually singled out in a room that is what makes it so difficult for a lot of people and so in the end the term that we started using in terms of black to nature was VME or visually minority ethnic Um, just because I suppose that summed up lots of the things that we were trying to convey around the work that we were doing. And that was very, like, internal, I suppose. That was just for Black Nature to have that term. But the really cool thing was that, like, when we started using that, other people picked up on that. And they were like, actually, there's something about this that does sort of appeal and does feel right compared to lots of the other terms that we've been I suppose experimenting with over the years Um, so I think like a really cool moment was when yeah I started to see people sort of mirroring or echoing that back to me and I was like oh cool we've managed to like come up with something that doesn't just work for us but also resonates with other people which is yeah Yeah. really nice. In terms of yourself for example what is a bird ringer? On a very simple level a bird ringer is someone who is doing scientific survey on birds studying them, you know, taking record of, I don't know, various measurements, how much they weigh, how big their wings are, things like that, and then putting a ring with a unique string of numbers around their leg and then letting the bird go again. And the purpose is, over the years, you're going to be recatching some of these birds. You can build up data about various things depending on the species. But, yeah, no, I've been doing it for, like, ten years now. <laughs> Why do you think people like us should care more about birds? I did a really interesting series recently that was about how birds are sirens of change, how they can be, like, indicative of 
wider issues, I suppose, going on in the world. And there were some very cool examples, some to do with climate change is impacting the globe. The way that we're treating the planet in some shape or form is harmful. Paying attention to the nature around us and maintaining that relationship is so important in terms of our future as well and making sure that we're going to continue to have a healthy planet to live on. And on that, what do you think is your biggest concern for the future of the planet and ornithology? I guess like the concerns around all of these environmental issues for me are twofold. Because one, we are destroying this planet, we are making it unlivable and that literally means that the future of humanity is like hanging by a string like not to be dramatic but it's literally true um and I think in general when talking about environmental issues in the west one of the things that people forget to talk about is that this isn't really a thing of the future there's already in Bangladesh millions of people who have been displaced who have been forced to move into the capital city because they where they live has literally disappeared you know people are dying but the other side of things is that I really deeply love and care about nature and the outdoors, which is why I think all these sort of vaguely dystopian suggestions of, you know, just carrying on as is, and then maybe we can, I don't know, all live in a pod bubble somewhere and ignore the world, you know, all that sort of nonsense. I think that's my main concern, because it's not just about the issues now. I think if and hopefully when we manage to deal with climate change in some shape or form, what I don't want to happen is there to be another new unexpected issue that pops up because we haven't learned our lesson and we're still taking and taking from this planet. In terms of kind of some advice, if we could do one thing to help save the planet, what do you think we should be doing now? In an age where so many people are dealing with eco-anxiety and are sort of on the verge of just sort of giving up on the future, I think like on the flip side of things, going out and actually seeing how many other people still care about these issues I think that that's also really energizing and you know I I suppose enables people to carry on and go and do other things to try and fight for this planet and our future thank you so much no thank you so much for having me this has been great how can we help each week we look at the ways we can help tackle the issues discussed in a feature we call how can we help As this week's episode is about the climate, we spoke to Ellie McMillan-Fox from Greenpeace. I wanted to get involved with Greenpeace because I was lucky enough to learn about climate change at university. The more I learned, the more I worried about it, and I felt that I had to do something to help. Since becoming a Greenpeace speaker, not only have I improved my knowledge of environmental challenges, but I've also felt a lot less worried about climate change. Knowing that you're doing something about it really helps. As young people, we will most be affected by environmental issues. When we get to the age that our parents are now, the world could be a completely different place. This is why it's so important for young people to engage in the environmental movement, because our voices matter the most when it comes to issues such as the climate crisis. We can't just leave the work to older generations who won't feel the impacts as much as we will. Through doing this role, I've helped to make a difference. Firstly, by spreading awareness of environmental issues. And secondly, by encouraging other young people to get involved. Whether it's writing a letter to the CEO of Tesco to get them to stop selling meat with links to deforestation, or reducing plastic waste in their school, People across the country have taken meaningful action as a consequence of my talks. There is loads that we can do as individuals to help save the planet, from reducing our plastic, driving less, or eating a more plant-based diet. There are many things that we can't personally change, like how energy is generated, deforestation in the Amazon, or how much plastic supermarkets produce. But what we can do as citizens and consumers is demand action from those who have the power to change it. Therefore, the most powerful thing that you can do to make a difference is use your voice. Whether it be signing one of Greenpeace's petitions, writing to an MP or CEO, 
or even just helping to raise awareness by talking to your friends and family. Using our voices together is how we as young people create real world change. Halim spoke to Nicola Brown, the digital producer for BBC's Blue Planet 2 and now impact producer at Freeborn Media, a production company that specialises in natural history storytelling. Nicola discussed the power of stories and how her work has shown her the impact humans have on the planet. Nicola, thanks so much for joining us. You are an impact producer and you've worked with the BBC, you've worked with Netflix, you've worked on some really incredible projects. If we could talk a bit about how you got into this industry? For me, you know, as a kid, I've always been obsessed with stories and storytelling. I always had my head in a book, always writing a story. And when I was at sixth form, I very much fell in love with moving image and being able to tell stories via picture. So for me, that was kind of my jumping off point into media. And I've always been obsessed with nature as well since I was a a kid. So when an opportunity came up to work in the world of natural history storytelling, I really jumped at it. So your role Am I right? It was an impact producer. What does that actually entail? So impact media is, you know, I think in our industry, it's thinking as wildlife filmmakers when we're telling stories about the natural world. It's how can we think about encouraging real world impact alongside our stories? For me, it is about social and digital storytelling and how that can really encourage new audiences to engage with challenging issues. The future of impact media is a really exciting one and it's such a new field that there is so much scope to do new things and I really hope that people listening, if they're interested in storytelling, if they're interested in trying to create change in this space, then please consider impact media because it needs all the voices that it can get. Blue Planet was hugely successful. I think it was the most watched show in 2017. Why do you think it really struck a nerve with people? There was obviously a lot of anticipation, I think, for the second series because people did love the first one. But it's amazing, you know, how the world of technology, for example, changed between the first and the second series. And what that meant for Blue Planet 2 was that the teams were able to really immerse audiences in that underwater world. So, you know, camera technology evolved hugely and the teams actually built cameras that allowed the viewer to get right into that world. So, for example, you know, they built a probe camera that's a teeny tiny camera that you can get right into a coral reef but still with a wide angle lens which just allows you to see that world like the fish that live on a coral reef would so it's more cinematic it's taking you into that world and of course the other major shift that's happened since the original blue planet is social media and that opened up a really exciting opportunity for us as digital storytellers to be able to react and respond to what audiences were talking about around the series and that was really the first time that that had been done with a BBC landmark so yeah it was a really exciting project to be part of. So obviously the first Blue Planet was made in 2001 and the second Blue Planet was made in 2017. What are the differences in the ocean? Were there any like physical clear changes in that period of time? I think what changed massively between the first series and the second series is an awareness of how much impact we as humans have on the ocean. So like with plastics, the team made a real conscious effort not to frame out plastics if they came across them. They wanted to show the reality of the situation. And I think that was really powerful. Like if you, especially there's a, a moment in the coral episode where um, the story is about a clownfish trying to lay its eggs. And one of the things that that clownfish picks up is a discarded plastic bottle and that's not even referred to in the commentary but for me that was a really powerful way of kind of acknowledging our impact on the ocean and yeah I think when you look at science over those last 16 years we're learning more and more about how humans are having an effect on the ocean and that can feel quite overwhelming sometimes but for me and with the work we're doing we're really excited to try and find out new ways of telling those stories that don't feel scary, that allow people to kind of learn about the problems, but then also look at the solutions and the hope and the things that are happening that can make a difference. Your message that you were trying to get across through working on this project, um, if you wanted someone to take one thing away, what would it be? 
Our biggest piece of content was about a photograph that hopefully people listening may have seen. Um, it was by a photographer called Justin Hoffman, who'd also worked as a camera op on the series. And he took this incredible photograph of a seahorse, a teeny tiny seahorse clinging onto a cotton bud. And we wanted to do something with Justin. And it happened that he was in the UK at the time for the Wildlife Photographer of the Year exhibition at the Natural History Museum. So we thought, well, why don't we tell the story behind this photograph? And we were able to turn that piece around really quickly. And because we released it at the time of the um, photography competition, it was the same week that Blue Planet 2 aired in the UK, it felt topical. And in the space of a week, we saw that video climb to 28 million views, which was astonishing wow. to see. And, you know, a couple of years later, it still gets shared. And I think the last time I checked, it was up to 50 million views, which is incredible. And for me, what I love about social and digital storytelling is that, you know, people are having a conversation right there on your content you can actually see what people are interested in learning more about what people are worried about what people are hopeful about so we were able to really tailor our storytelling to what audiences wanted to know more about which was amazing now i want to talk a little bit about the new projects you're working on hashtag see our future yes can you tell us a bit more about that we kind of see it as taking off from where our blue planet left off so it's all about thinking how can we engage new audiences in challenging ocean issues um, and how can we kind of flip the script and tell stories in new ways there's a communication strategist called Nikki Hawkins who has such an amazing brain like I love chatting to her her work is really focused on researching how language and how the way we tell stories can really have an impact on how people relate to challenging issues and how people actually engage with them. So part of what we're doing is taking that framing work, combining that with our experience of what works well in the social space around oceans and digital storytelling, to really think about being more inclusive. So everything we're doing, we kind of say we're, we want to reach outside of the echo chamber because when you work in the natural history world, when you work in conservation, we come across these stories all the time. So it's that space for us and the work we're doing at Freeborn Impact that's really exciting is thinking about how can we engage people who aren't engaged already. So this episode is called Whose Job Is It To Save The Planet? So I'm wondering if I can ask you that question... Whose job do you think it is to save the planet? I think it's all of our jobs, um, if I can answer in that way. Because if more people cared, I feel like more change would be possible. When you look at what happened with Blue Planet 2 and what we saw with plastics, people felt inspired to do something because they saw the effects of the problem in the ocean world. And what we essentially just did then was say, well, here's some information. But it was actually people themselves that drove that and wanted to see change there, that wanted to go and do beach cleans, that wanted to reduce their, their plastic consumption. So for me, that's part of it. But also I think, you know, plastics is quite tangible. People can see a plastic bottle on a beach or a straw up a turtle's nose. They can equate their behaviour to that. But when you look at issues such as climate change or the biodiversity crisis, they're huge complex issues that people can't necessarily relate to in the same way as plastics. So I think the more that we can do to tell stories in those spaces as well just means it opens it up to more people and hopefully that's where we can start to see more solutions and more ways forward. Thank you so much, Nicola. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Reading list. Each week we're getting our guests to recommend a book that's helped them. This week's books are... The book that I would recommend to lots of young people is The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. It's about someone who's learning about how they can achieve their goals and not looking at other people with jealousy and losing hope, but instead learning from them and just really growing as a person. My book recommendation would be This Is An Uprising by Engler and Engler which very famously is the book that went on to inspire Extinction Rebellion and things like that. But I think my main message coming away from the book was, again, how much power people really have. It's all about how to form an effective movement that can really influence the world around you. And, it, like, one of the things it highlights is, you know, how few people you actually need to make change and what that would look like. 
So the book that I'd recommend reading is Working Hard, Hardly Working by Grace Beverly. For anybody that's not aware of Grace Beverly, she's an entrepreneur. She's built two really successful businesses. And what I love about her is how everything is sustainable. So she's got um, a clothing brand that's all sustainably sourced. Everything she's doing is just really pioneering. And here at Youth Rising, we recommend I Quit Plastic by Kate Nelson. It's a perfect guide for ways to reduce your single-use plastic consumption. Join us again next week as we discuss privacy online. And remember to rate, review and follow Youth Rising wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out our socials at NCS on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat and YouTube. I'm Muslim Mahmood and thank you to Halim, Lottie, Pabdika, Sophie and of course our guests Ella, Amy, Nicola, Ellie and Myros. This was a Something Else production for NCS where young people turn No You Can into No We Can. Young Voices, Big Issues. Join us as we explore the real power of Youth Rising. Youth Rising. Youth Rising, Youth Rising Podcast by NCS.